do know that I'm aware that um, that our, our union colleagues are meeting with others, uh, are meeting are meeting with them, um, health and safety in in terms of other parts of the corporation. So that is ongoing, and absolutely one of the things from um, from me in terms of linking in with our health and safety colleagues, which is to which is obviously to bring this to uh, to their attention and and it become part of their plans. But um, I know that our union colleagues are working with other parts of the corporation with regards to this because it, as you quite rightly say chair this is um this is all of our this is in this is for all of us yeah of course yeah. um there doesn't seem to be a policy of zero tolerance of violence um against employees particularly in the market there's no signs up you see them in I don't know, mcdonald's tesco railway stations but there's nothing here and when i looked into this a couple of years ago i was drawn to the loan working policy oh it's in there it's a paragraph well that's not good enough it has to be on its own it has to be implemented posters up because there's a lot of violence from the public and assaults go on in in out in the field in these markets so just to take that into account on from that the the, the barbican center have done a really good piece on that and i think the town uh, at Mansion House, I think actually have adopted that zero tolerance. Uh, it's kind of like it's not a policy; it's it's almost like a guideline. But it's maybe something, Pauline, we can pick up on as well that can feed into this as a corporate wide piece as well. Yeah, good. Yes, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with that, Diane. And as you know, one of the things that we are doing is going to have a policy framework, which you will be feeding into, which you um, will be feeding into in terms of as because there's a, all of these policies that we've mentioned this afternoon are really important, all of them. Um, and if you were to ask me, which do you prioritise after, you know, which do you put first? They all have equal, they all have equal merit. Um, and one of the things that we are, that we are looking at is that we do have, we will have to prioritise um, some policies ahead of others um, um, in terms of those where they impact our employees, employees the most. But I think, again, I'm, I really want to stress that we are looking at all of our policies. Um, some policies where we have got guidance, we need to also look at that guidance and whether it should be a, and whether it should be a policy and, you know, and absolutely make that call and take on board the learnings that we have already got from our colleagues that are doing this really well. Um, so we're not we're not starting from a place of scratch. We're we're starting from a place of improvement. Another yeah, Ben. Yeah, um, just to follow on from what Pauline was saying, I mean, it's not an entirely bleak picture. There are good practices going on within the corporation, and you know, you, you can take something out of the fact that you know, um, what was it, thirty three percent haven't had a what was it? One of the stats is thirty three percent do not feel safe at work. Well, sixty seven percent do. Okay, so it's not all just black and white. Um, there's a lot of nuance in between i think from the union's point of view i mean something we've started doing is is conducting workplace inspections health and safety inspections in conjunction with colleagues in health and safety i think for for us it's going to be monitoring um it's going to be i mean one of the problems we we also see is like um shortage of labor so where there's shortage of, of labor and staffs or teams are understaffed that puts tremendous strain on people and pressure OK, and then you've got workloads as well. So, I mean, I, I would suggest that's something that needs looking at. Mon I think it's a monitoring thing. I mean, I'm sure there's all the data there, but again, sometimes I think it gets lost that the data is, is acquired. But it's not necessarily looking at how that can advantage our members and employees. It's more like you, you might be looking at corporate risk, something like that. but. You know, my argument or our argument is that actually by addressing this, you're going to increase, you're going to improve the morale of the staff, um, which is which is a good thing. You know, it's, it's a business driven reason for looking at health and safety, looking at the information, the data, the, the consoles or whatever you've got, and then really using that to your advantage because it's got to be data driven. Can I, can I just ask, in terms of the health and safety inspections, I presume, you know, that is, uh, there is a convention within trade unions to, to do that, and yeah. I fully understand why that would be the case. But, you know, 
would it could we get to a point where you know we're beefing up our health and safety function yes uh you know uh, is is how much of that is duplication? How much do you feel it is required? So I'm not saying it's a bad, you know, it's obviously a good thing mm, that you're doing mm. this because it sounds like some of these things we wouldn't necessarily be picking up on otherwise. Mm. But but how, you know, from the outside, it seems as though there's kind of like two systems in place doing that. Um, well, I mean, to an extent, I mean, to be very simple, very simply, if if the employer is doing its own inspections, it's marking its own homework. Mm. Yeah. So I think when the unions come in, they're doing it for a, for a different interest group. Yeah. We're doing it for our members. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's not room for us collaborating, but it's just we we sort of have a different agenda. Yeah. If I'm being perfectly yes. honest. Yeah. Uh, Diane, I don't know if you want to say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I've been doing you know sort of uh, health and safety inspections at Tabridge and the Monument since I became a, 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 a steward. So um, it's it's important. And managers like us, you know, we've talked about critical friend. You know, something might be missed. We're there with the same goal. You know, we want to keep people safe, keep the visitors safe. And, and that's the purpose of what um, the inspections are about, which should be done once a year. Um, and you'll always find something. Yeah, you're always going to find something that something's been missed. So it's just good to have that second check. It's it, it's the diversity of the sites that is unique to the city of London. So not one inspection is the same. You know, this building, open spaces, you know, Tower Bridge, you know, it's all very different. So it does pull on our resources, but it's they have to be approached individually as well because they all have their own individual risks. Um, but um, you know that's that's part of what we responsible for as the union as well is safety and and keeping people safe. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Hey, um, just a quick question for Pauline. Pauline, um, is is health and safety um training across the corporation mandatory, and is it tracked about who's done it and how and um, and also has um has it been updated recently to talk about some of the issues that our colleagues have raised? So actually what to do if you you know you don't feel safe at work or something has happened to you at work and, and stuff like that. It would be interesting just to hear from you. The simple answer at the moment is is that no, I can't confirm that it, that it is available, um, but we will absolutely note it and, and come back to you in terms of where we are on that, um, because absolutely it needs to be incorporated. It needs to be incorporated. So the simple answer is not at this t not at this time. I can't confirm that. But questions. Library. Sorry, Chair. I have my hand up. Oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. So sorry, Nick. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Um, yeah, I'd just like to make a comment uh, just on the health and safety is that uh, um, I think it would be uh, something to work towards collaboratively to try to improve. I know we've had members raise their concerns uh, regarding one particular location, which Pauline, I'm happy to email you um, offline about. Um, but these are concerns which are really very serious, but I think not a lot of action has been taken. So it would be good work, good to work collaboratively to resolve that because I say we've had reps raise their concerns, but we haven't seen a lot of action on that. Yes, please do contact me. Thanks very much. OK, so library, please. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background for those of us who, of those of you who may be less familiar with the library, which is perfectly reasonable. We're a bit of a hidden gem. Um, there has been a library at Guildhall since 1425, thanks to a bequest in Richard Whittington's will of, of cat fame. Um, the medieval library existed until the 16th century uh, when it was pinched by the Duke of Somerset uh, for, to furnish Somerset House. Um, there has in that into into the sorry in the in between period there was a sort of civic library a legal library uh, for corporation staff as we would now call them um, but a public library wasn't refounded until 1875 um, we are now the you know the 
the descendants of that library. We moved into the West Wing in uh, 1974, so it's on our anniversary next year. Um, we are fairly unique across the country in being a public reference library. So we are both uh, a place of important research and a place for vulnerable people to get off the street, look for work on the computers, sit in a warm place. We have no access barriers to using the library. There's no paperwork or library card needed to access the computers. And the majority of the collections can be accessed without that paperwork as well. We very much want to be as open as possible and we're very successful in that. Um, our hybrid events, hybrid since COVID, uh, reach an audience of thousands worldwide. The, the average audience for each event is around two to three hundred online and sixty in person. Uh, we have a Zoom license of up to seven hundred, and we have events that do reach that. We do have to turn people away even online. Um, our speakers include many city guides, but uh, academics, amateur historians. They speak for free, which we're very grateful for, on a range of topics covering the history of London uh, and beyond. Um, we are arguably the largest collection of works on a single city in the entire world. That's our retired principal librarian's claim. Um, so as well as focusing on the history of the City of London in particular and the wider city, uh, we house the archives and libraries of over 80 livery companies. Uh, we have the Lloyd's Maritime Collection, which was deposited in the 1950s by Lloyd's of London, covering merchant navy vessels, shipping movements and casualties, which is quite important for people researching financial history. Um, we have the archives of the Stock Exchange back to the very beginnings in 1698. Um, an example of some of the work we've been doing this year, uh, Folio Day on April 24th was the celebration of the 400th anniversary of the publishing of Shakespeare's first folio in 1623. We, uh, the city, holds the closest copy of the first folio to its birthplace. It was printed half a mile away in the Barbican, sold in St Paul's Churchyard, and we have one of the top five copies in the world. We're we're honoured to, to house it. Um, uh, so our day was a display of that and an on the hour talk from uh, various librarians. We had over 800 people visiting us in five hours. Uh, we were featured on over 200 international uh, news agencies and our principal librarian was interviewed alongside Simon Sharma on BBC Radio 4 that morning, which brought a lot of the, the footfall. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for letting us be here and my colleagues Ben and Diane for inviting us. Um, so we have an amazing collection and we bring in quite a good number of visitors. We have on average 50 to 80 people join us every day in the city. Um, well, we're a very small team, that's roughly equivalent to the numbers who visit LMA. Um, but despite our wonderful collection and a wonderful service, um, we've had what we consider to be a disproportionate effect on our staffing from Tom and Tom 2. Um, we have two groups of people who manage the library, collections assistants and the librarians, and our collections assistants have gone down from three staff to just one, so he's got no one to cover him on lunch, and if he's on sick then his manager has to cover him. And we've gone from five professional librarian posts down to 2.5. Um, as you can imagine, this has had quite an impact on our service and we've had to change the way the library works. It used to be you could just come into the library, ask to see any item in our collection and the guys would retrieve it for you in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, now we have to have everyone order everything in advance, um, emailing us ahead of time, making an appointment, deciding what you want to see, um, which is quite difficult for our users because a lot of them don't know what they want to see until they get there and talk to the librarians and find out what do you have on my grandfather or this topic. Um, and also we've seen a major cut in our opening hours. We've lost 45% of our opening hours, almost half. Um, we used to be open Monday to Friday, nine to five, with a late night on Wednesday and two Saturdays a month. And now our opening hours are just Monday to Thursday, 10 to four which means we've lost all out of hours service provision, which means anyone who's a professional is working full time has to take time off if they want to come and visit us. Um, we've just finished our 2023 user survey and um, thankfully our users still like us very much. We were recommend, rated as good to excellent by 97% of the people who took our survey, which is 130 people. 
Um, and the biggest suggestions that we had on the feedback side of it was they'd like to see us expand our opening hours again to what it was in pre-COVID times and also to return to the on-demand retrieval. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed for that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, I think um, Ben and I just thought it would be interesting and to, to, to raise this at this uh, in this forum. Um, thank you both to Sarah and uh, Melanie. I know they were quite nervous about this. Uh, but I think, you know, we talk about destination city. Um, we, you know, I worked at the Guildhall Art Gallery and Roman Amphitheatre for 17 years. You know, I'm into culture and, and heritage. So um, it's it's a really, really important asset we've got. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's it sounds like it's being run down. You know, it's 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 you know, it's it struck a chord to, to Ben and I when we went to visit there and um, they are wor working on empty, really, aren't you? you? You're doing amazing, but, you know, it's that, that they're that they're pushed. In, in terms of just before I come, uh, you come in, Flossie, in terms of obviously the service committee areas, you know, this this service committee, as you both know, deals with HR. So and it's interesting to hear from more than interesting to hear from an HR perspective in terms of the staff stories on that. So we are particularly interested in I've got the paper here in terms of the staff experience and what this means for you, which I think is the important thing for us to take away from this. But needless to say, in terms of the cultural heritage libraries, if it's still called that, so that mm -hmm. committee. Is it is it okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so 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 um that is you know a forum where I'm sure this can be raised in terms of its kind of strategic piece, um, so to speak. But as I said, you know, we're particularly interested to hear, like you were saying, Ben, about you know, if there's um, if there's less staff, what the effects are in terms of stress and workload, mm -hmm. etc. So um I said that question, I'm having said that in terms of the service that one um obvious thing to me is in terms of the stakeholders there's quite a few stakeholders that you're looking after and deliveries are they still active uh, in terms of their their engagement with the library um yes we are still collecting materials from them and they have members from the company in every day using our collections yeah. researching their history still and do they provide support to that do they are they not <laughs> actually <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Anyway, okay. Flossie. Hello. Um, thank you. That's been that's been so interesting. Um, it's really intriguing to hear the history behind it, and it just shows you the diversity of what we do here and why it's so important. So the reason why Alistair was laughing at me is I actually work for the stock exchange, and uh, <laughs> it's just kind of like my game. And but and also as a member of a livery company, I think that you're absolutely right. It doesn't this isn't within our remit. But one of the things that it does highlight to me is that maybe we should be asking people who we provide the service to actually contribute in some way, whether it be financially. The stock exchange, we've got a foundation. If you reached out to them to see if they can give, you know, um, you know, financial support and stuff like that. So maybe that's something that you raise with the Culture Heritage and Libraries Committee because it's not something we should be doing for free, actually, if they're coming in every day and using our facility. So maybe that's a conversation to be had. But just, um, just to give some ideas there, you can send some emails. <laughs> OK, any other points or questions? No? Yes, Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben and then Yeah, I mean, I... I'm not sure that it's entirely within the libraries committee. I think there are issues that have been raised which are employee yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what I'm most concerned about is that actually a lot of these impacts are as a result of the TOM. OK, so that's something we can discuss here. Um, what we're looking at is that a reduction in staff or service, which means effectively that people are having, they're definitely having difficulties taking annual leave because they can't organise, um, what is it, service. You know, they can't have someone on the desk and someone producing the books. OK, so, um, and then you, you're talking about there's no room for training, development, and uh, just being constantly preoccupied with business as usual. So there's a lack of resilience. Yeah, arguably that could be something for the Libraries Committee, but uh, that's my argument. And yeah, OK, so the service not being reflective of a, a world-class city, there's a reputation, and you, but you're saying that should go to the library. 
I think so, but I was acknowledging there the fact that, and you've elaborated on it there, that there are obviously staff effects of all these things. So, I mean, you know, I suggest that that is the forum, but clearly we are concerned. And there are some generic things here which apply across the piece. Just what, you know, Fozzie's right, it's very diverse, but there are some common themes that we are very aware of, and we've discussed before, that, you know, there are staff under pressure here doing many people's jobs. Mm. And well, and, th and also thank you for not, you know, because presumably you could take time off and the service, there could be more of a service denial than there actually is. So, you know, we, we, we acknowledge that. Yeah. OK, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And um, thank you for, for, for that information and the background to that. That was really interesting to hear. Um, I, I would echo uh, the chairman's points around um, we're offering a service to other areas for free and we need to look at how do we bring in that additional support um, to make the, to build some resilience within your team. Um, and I think one of the things I could put you in touch with is our transformation team being a um, to support and look at how could we build a business case around this, um, what are our opportunities and how can we progress through this? Because I think those are the kind of things that we need to look at and work together with. So happy to get in touch with you afterwards and uh, provide those details to you. It's brilliant. Thanks, Sonia. Oh. All I'd say is just let's go through the channels in terms of that's right, the idea has been initiated here, but this isn't a service committee, so we mustn't tread on their toes. So we must send it up and then, you know, it's got obviously it's got our blessing in terms of trying that out. Yeah. OK, next to us. OK, um, I think now we're on to 4D, the family friendly policy for City London Police. That will be myself. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. Okay, Margaret. Hi, thank you, uh, Chairman. I am Margaret Raymond Unite. Um, so I wanted to bring to your attention the family friendly policy that's specific to the City of London Police and caters for police officers. The policy talks about um, parental leave, keeping in touch days, um, time off for medical appointments, etc., etc. Recently, the policy has been uh, updated in the form of an addition to the policy that has had a sign off from the chief officer team. That's our senior police officers. And um, this option, this additional option um, allows police officers to come back from parental leave on a phase in return. And that means that, for example, in, in the first week when they return from parental leave, they will do 50 percent of their duties. In the second week, they will do 60% of their duties. In the third week, 75%, and in the fourth week, 90%. This comes with no financial detriment to the police officers in question, and the financial envelope will be picked up by the City of London Police. Um, the unions have made representations before um, about this policy um, that it, it needs to be more inclusive and consideration is to be given to open this option to the police staff and also other colleagues within the Corporation of London. Um, so what, what we're asking now that um, this is considered um, and go, obviously goes through a proper process um, and hopefully will include um, police staff and colleagues at the Corporation of London. Um, I know obviously that will uh, in incur a cost but um, the aim of this option is to retain um, police officers. So uh, what we want to do as well is to retain police staff and um, other colleagues within the Corporation of London. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. And just to clarify here, um, this committee's got um, oversight for, as you know, the police staff. Uh, but not the uniformed officers, which would be the police authority. Um, so just but but to be clear, what you're asking for is effect in basic terms for the policy that applies to police officers, the uniformed staff to apply to the civilian non uniform staff. But that that's correct. Yeah. And also for the for the colleagues at the Corporation of London to make sure that it's all inclusive. OK. Do we have a response now? Are we going to? Um... Uh, this one I'd like to take. I'd, I'd like to take away, if that's okay with everybody. So we'll bring it back to the next JCC market. Thank you for raising Thank that. You. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you, Chair. Those are all of the items of business that we were made aware of in advance. So we move then to item five, questions on matters relating to the work of the committee. Uh, I've not had any in advance, but does anybody wish to raise any at this stage? Yeah, yeah can, I, can I just say that um, well, we've had some useful conversations here, but um, in my experience, it's quite important to get the most out of this meeting, that any issues that you want the unions want to bring here are first of all discussed at officer level and um, so that we can actually at these meetings get a view uh, of where uh, officers are. So hopefully uh, many times they'll agree with you guys, sometimes they won't and then I think it's for us as members to see where where the differences are and what lead, what steer we can give to officers going forward. I think that would make this a more a more effective meeting perhaps uh, with with Pauline, you can sort of work out how we might best achieve that going forward. I just I think that's right. I say the only uh, exceptions are perhaps hearing like the testimony and things like that, and hearing some things. But it's right we should hear firsthand on some things. That is definitely there's definitely utility there. But I think I said before about sometimes the jointly presented stuff where we want to hear actually where there is actually a resolution on things, and it effectively wants our needs our political endorsement or whatever, or as Steve says, where actually you're getting nowhere with our colleagues, and we and you're basically bumping it up to a higher level. So, um, yeah, I mean we haven't been overwhelmed with business, and thank you for putting these things on the agenda. But like I suppose as as these things develop, it's going to be a lot of stuff on the agenda in the future with with a well HR you know all this transformation stuff going on that it would it that may be a way of working I mean at the end of the day it's for you to bring what you like to the forum but yeah thanks okay yeah all right thank you chairman item six I'm not aware of any other business uh, considered urgent no. for public session uh, can we therefore agree to exclude the public at item seven please agreed yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I'll just wait for confirmation that the live stream has been ended. And thank you to those who've been viewing publicly. Confirmation that the live feed has ended, Chair. So we move 